Hello and welcome once again to the STEER channel by Dr. Amdekar's team. I am Dr. Tushar Manyar, pediatrician from Andheri, and I'll be talking today on early detection of non infectious causes of diarrhea. When we have a child with diarrhea, the commonest problem is the gastrointestinal infection, whether it is viral, bacterial, or protozoal. Next, the cause could be an infectious cause but outside of the GI tract and not directly responsible as an infection causing diarrhea. This could be a urinary tract infection, otitis media, sepsis or pneumonia and this is more commonly seen in younger children also called as parenteral diarrhea. We can have diarrhea from gastrointestinal cause, intestinal causes which are non-infectious like you have inflammatory bowel disease or you can have malabsorption syndromes. Then one could have a non-gastrointestinal cause of non-infectious diarrhea, namely conditions like endocrine, functional problems or sometimes rarely some tumors sitting somewhere else. So how do we approach this problem? Whenever we have a child with diarrhea, we first think of it as acute infectious diarrhea and they typically present as acute gastroenteritis. So they are acute, usually preceded by vomiting or some abdominal pain, having large watery motions with or without cramping. The clinical hallmark of that being dehydration. Fever may or may not be there. And usually with a simple treatment, they are almost self-limiting and do not go on for a long period of time. Sometimes these acute diarrhea can be having blood, mucus, can have high fever and the child could be toxic and one would think in terms of bacillary dysentery or very rarely even amoebic dysentery. Sometimes these are confused with other non-infectious causes and we will dwell upon that a little later. When we have a child with acute food poisoning, we use this term loosely for toxin induced or poison or chemical induced diarrhea and vomiting. They are also acute and self limiting. So now what are the red flags by which we will start thinking about non-infectious causes early? As we mentioned, the most important thing is most commonly infectious diarrhea resolve within few days. So any diarrhea which is prolonged or it's recurrent is not associated with fever or has failure to thrive or a child who is not healthy and happy in between the episodes of diarrhea or of course has any other systemic flags which will point towards some other condition than a standard gastrointestinal infection, one would think about non-infectious cause of diarrhea. How do we approach this problem. Let's take it age wise. You have a premature baby and who gets loose motions, one would think in terms of necrotizing enterocolitis. A child is born and then on breastfeeding, on day 4 or 5, they have multiple loose motions which could be greenish yellow and transitioning from muconium to breastfeed stools. This is known as transitional diarrhea. These are non-infectious diarrhea. But if you have a child, newborn who comes on day 5, 6 or even by the end of one week with vomiting more than diarrhea, child is extremely dehydrated, please make sure to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia by looking at the genitals as well as doing appropriate investigations. The child, the infant, when he comes to you with diarrhea which does not look like in common infectious diarrhea, one would think in terms of lactose intolerance which will be characterized by excessively gassy, bloated tummy and perianal rashes and a child who is on mother's milk or on formula feeds. Now they usually have perianal extreme perianal redness and very watery large stools. If this kind of perianal redness is there along with oral ulcers 
and some skin conditions, one would think in terms of acrodermatitis and tropathica. We have infants who come with diarrhea more like with blood and not thriving well and looking pale, one would think of cow milk protein allergy. While we look at these important but not so common malabsorption issues in infants, we must remember that breastfeed can be resulting in multiple golden yellow frothy stools and this is called as breast milk stools and these are definitely much more common than the other conditions. We already discussed that infants are prone to what is called as parenteral diarrhea. That means there is infection in the body but not in the gastrointestinal tract and thereby causing loose motions. So we must be able to treat the source and not trying to treat the gastrointestinal problem directly. We have to also now look at children who are slightly bigger and there we come across what is known as toddler's diarrhea or and are also called as overfeeding diarrhea. So that these children are, these babies are either fed too much or if they are fed on high carbohydrate containing liquids in the form of juices, etc., then they could be passing multiple soft or loose tools and they would be not a problem and not be considered a recurrent infection situation. If the child has been given antibiotics for some other reason that could alter the gut flora and result in diarrhea, which would be commonly known as antibiotic associated diarrhea. The other more sinister causes of non-infectious cause is intersusception. And if you see a child who is passing small stools, is cramping, crying excessively or is lethargic, then even before the stools become so-called red currant jelly, one could make a diagnosis of uh, high index of suspicion for intersusception and investigate accordingly. One could have a child with recurrent loose motions and some respiratory complaints and not thriving properly, not putting on weight. If you go back in history, you might find history of delayed passage of meconium or something like a meconium plug syndrome and one would think about ruling out cystic fibrosis. When the child is little bigger, we could have a child who is not growing in height, is pale and is having complaints of recurrent loose motions and along with vomiting, with pelor and some other systemic signs may be there. And one would start thinking in terms of cystic, sorry, in terms of celiac disease. But if the blood mucus is more, it's also simultaneously fever in between and some joint complaints or ulcerations in, uh, in the oral tract. One would think in terms of inflammatory bowel disease and think about ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. You have a child who is in the teenage group, make sure to rule out for a prolonged chronic recurrent diarrhea. One should start thinking in terms of Addison's disease. And if you have other signs of fever which you can't localize, but there is I, there are eye changes, there are tremors, then these are the signs for thyrotoxicosis, which could present as non-infectious cause of diarrhea. In adolescent and teenage groups, in the current scenario with stress and other conditions, one could have irritable bowel syndrome and sometimes other functional disorders in the form of laxative abuse and bulimia, etc. Also, we must remember that if there are signs and symptoms of food allergies, skin allergies, then one should think in terms of eosinophilic gastroenteritis. And rarely, one could have a child which is coming with recurrent infections, which could be along with diarrhea. It could be an immunocompromised child which can have infectious as well as non-infectious causes of diarrhea. Rarely, one could have certain tumors like neuroblastoma or certain uh, 
secreting tumors which could lead to secretory diarrhea. So friends, when before we conclude, let us realize that diarrhea first and foremost most commonly is going to be acute gastrointestinal cause and if they don't fit into the standard pattern, we must start thinking early in terms of non-infectious diarrhea. When we think of non-infectious diarrhea, make sure to rule out common conditions which are not very dangerous or not critical. But also keep in mind certain conditions like CAH, intersusception or additions which require urgent and early diagnosis in order to prevent complications. Thank you once again for your patient hearing.